Good morning, my name's Deborah and I'm on the staff here and I guess many of you will be very familiar with Joseph and the story of the Technicolor uh, dream coat and today's reading is quite long and so I'm challenging those of you who think, hey, I know this, to listen very carefully and to settle back and think this is one of the most powerful stories as we look at over the next few weeks and think I need to hear it afresh, I need to hear it anew today. So it's on page 39 of your scriptures, if you, Bible in front of you, if you'd like to follow along. And let's settle in for the first chapter of this amazing story. Genesis 37. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhar and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he'd been born to him in his old age and he made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, Listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brothers said to him, Do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream and this time the sun and moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him. But his father kept the matter in mind. Now his brothers had gone to graze their father's flocks near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, As you know, your brothers are grazing the flocks near Shechem. Come, I'm going to send you to them. Very well, he replied. So he said to him, Go and see if all is well with your brothers and with the flocks and bring word back to me. Then he sent him off. From the valley of Hebron. When Joseph arrived at Shechem, a man found him wandering around in the fields and asked him, What are you looking for? And he replied, I'm looking for my brothers. Can you tell me where they're grazing their flocks? Well, they've moved on from here, the man answered. I heard them say, Let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. But they saw him in the distance. And before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. When Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into this cistern here in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take him back to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe he was wearing, and they took him and threw him into the cistern. The cistern was empty, there was no water in it. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices balm and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, What will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he's our brother, our own flesh and blood. His brothers agreed. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. 
When Reuben returned to the cistern and saw that Joseph was not there, he tore his clothes. He went back to his brothers and said, The boy isn't there. Where can I turn now? Then they got Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, and dipped the robe in the blood. They took the ornate robe back to their father and said, We found this. Examine it to see whether it is your son's robe. He recognised it and he said, It is my son's robe. Some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and daughters came to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, I will continue to mourn until I join my son in the grave. So his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. Deb, very well read. Morning, everyone. My name is Nathan. That is a cracker of a story for us this morning. What will we make of it? Um, Before we get started looking at the word, just a quick... um, Announcement about baptisms. Uh, you might have received a text yesterday. Uh, we have we were planning to um, to do them straight after this service at midday today, but uh, you might have noticed it's been a bit wet over the course of the last couple of days, and uh, the harbour is in no state for people to be baptised in. So we're going to wait a couple of weeks and uh, and have another go um, towards the end of April. So for those of you who are coming, uh, just delay that a couple of weeks, and then we'll get back into it. Time for us to pray about this amazing story as we get started together. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for this word, the word that you are sowing into our hearts this morning, and we just pray that it might take such deep root that by it, in our lives, you might produce 30, 60, even 100 times what is sown here this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm just going to go out and say it. I am not a big fan of reality TV. I'm sorry about that. I know there might be fans in the building this morning and that is fine, but the only time you're going to find me watching reality TV really is on those lazy afternoons on a Saturday where you're just kind of mindlessly flicking through the TV. I don't know what it is about Saturday Arvos, but there is a lot of reality TV on at that time. Maybe that says something, but you know, and Seven Mate, there'll be Pool Kings. I don't know if you ever watched Pool Kings before, but It's about people building crazy pools. That sounds exciting, doesn't it? Or if that's not, doesn't float your boat, on uh, Nine Gem, there's Tanked, which is about two guys just building ridiculous aquariums for people. Or over on Seven Bravo, there's Shark Tank, which it turns out, disappointingly, has nothing to do with either fish or bodies of water. There you go. But as I'm flicking through the channels, I'll often sit there going, (laughs) who is watching these shows? Pool Kings, Tanked, Shark Tank. Turns out lots of people, actually, lots of people. Next to news, reality TV is the most watched genre of television in Australia. How about that? Eh? Uh, A 2021 study, Australian study, revealed that 92% of us have watched reality TV at some point and 63% are current viewers. Why? (laughs) Why? Well, more than half of those who were identified as current viewers admitted that the reason they watched reality TV was for the high drama and the conflict. Now, by all reports, the gold standard for high drama and conflict in the reality TV world is keeping up with the Kardashians. Now, this show recently finished after, get this, 13 years on the air, 20 seasons of this show, if you can believe it. It documents the fortunes and the misfortunes of the celebrity-soaked Kardashian-Jenner family. It looks something like this, in all its glory. (laughs) Family, friends and feuds. If you think that looks a little complicated, (laughs) get a load of the synopsis for season 11 of Keeping Up With The Kardashians. Prepare yourself. Courtney and Scott break up. 
and the family gets comfortable with the news that Bruce is now Caitlin. Scott finishes his time in rehab and Lamar overdoses in Las Vegas. Meanwhile, Chloe moves forward with her divorce. Kendall is annoyed that Kylie spends all her time with her boyfriend, Tiger, and Kim has her second child with her third husband, Kanye. (laughs) You want to watch it now, don't you? Now, there's only really two things I can glean from all of that. Firstly, there are a lot of people with names starting with the letter K. Secondly, that family sounds dysfunctional, doesn't it? Which I'm sure is actually part of the appeal. But reality TV, in some ways, is really the attempt to take someone else's dysfunction for our entertainment. There's something about dysfunction that draws us in, isn't there? Maybe that's because it resonates with our own experience, or perhaps, maybe more likely, it's the exact opposite. I mean, who doesn't like the reassurance that comes from being able to sit there and go, well, at least my family is not that dysfunctional. Now, when it comes to the Bible, there are plenty of examples of dysfunctional families, some that even rivaled the Kardashian clan, if that was even possible. Well, like the family we just read about in Genesis 37. Much like a reality TV show, Jacob's family is plagued by conflict, rivalry, high drama. Like, it is pretty dysfunctional, isn't it? Over the next few weeks, as Belle said, we're going to be taking a deep dive into this family story. And I've got to tell you, it is one of the most epic in the entire Bible. A famous book reviewer from the New York Times was once quoted as saying this about Joseph's story. Purely as narrative and background, she writes, there is a magnificent story here which exceeds in drama, opulence and movement anything that Hollywood has ever dreamed. Now, we're not spending these weeks in Joseph's story for our entertainment or because His family dysfunction makes us feel better about our own. The story of Joseph is worth paying attention to because it so clearly displays the way that God is at work in our world. And these events are are thousands and thousands of years old, and yet the themes are just as relevant to us today as they've ever been. And the God, the God who is at work in Joseph's dysfunctional story is the very same God who is still at work in our own dysfunctional stories. It might be ancient written, but it's still modern speaking. I think you'll see that today as we work through it. Genesis 37 really drops us into the middle of things. And so we're just going to wind back a little bit, give a bit of background. I think that might be helpful before we crack in. Jacob was Joseph's father. And by this stage in the story, he's got four wives. Now, that was acceptable in ancient Near Eastern culture. But, you know, in the Bible, it never ends well. It never ends well. That's what we see happening here. Because even though Jacob had four wives, he really only loved one, Rachel. She was the first and really his only true love but she was also barren. She couldn't have children. That was a big deal, a big deal especially for this family because this family was the family of the promise. Back in Genesis 12, God had promised this family that He would make them into a great nation which included more offspring than they could possibly count. Babies were a big deal, especially to this family. Jacob ends up taking other wives just so that he could have children, which is what he did. He ended up having 10 sons to his other three wives. One day, in his old age, Rachel finally did give him sons, two of them, Joseph and Benjamin. These were miracle babies. And because Rachel was his treasured wife, Joseph became Jacob's treasured son. And so even though he was the 11th born, Jacob favoured him as if he was the eldest. And as we've seen in Genesis 37 this morning, it's, it's this favouritism that is fueling the bitterness and the hatred for Joseph amongst the other 10 brothers. 
Now, if this was a reality TV show, the conflict that we see here, it's actually not season one, it's more like season three, (laughs) because it turns out this kind of mess is nothing new for this family. Barrenness, blatant favoritism, and brotherly bitterness, it's like a feature of this family's dysfunction for generations. It all begins with with Joseph's great-grandparents, Abraham, Sarah, the ones that God originally made this grand, sweeping promise to. Sarah, like Rachel, was Abraham's beloved, and also like Rachel, she couldn't have children. And so that drove Abraham to have a son with someone else. But then in God's faithfulness, she did eventually have a son in her old age, Isaac. And because Isaac had been born of Sarah, Abraham's beloved, he favoured this second son, Isaac, over his firstborn son. Sound familiar? Now, this favouritism ends up kicking off such bitter rivalry between these two siblings, Abraham actually ended up having to send Ishmael away. Very similar thing happens in the generation to follow. Isaac's wife, Rebecca, also barren for a long time. Then she finally has twins, Esau, the firstborn, and Jacob, who would eventually become Joseph's father. Once again, the younger son is favoured over the older. Rebecca manages to secure for Jacob the blessing that belonged to Esau. Once again, there is bitter rivalry between the two brothers, so much so that Esau even tries to murder Jacob. Talk about history repeating itself, right? The sins of the father echoing through the generations. I mean, that is a perfect example of it, isn't it? This family has got form. The dysfunction runs deep. And remember, this is Abraham, Isaac and Jacob we're talking about here, right? Fathers of our faith. Heroes of the Bible. This is the family of the promise. This is is God's chosen people, His vessel for bringing salvation to the ends of the earth. This lot. Despite all of their dysfunction. It's incredible, isn't it? Incredible. And as we move through Joseph's story together over the coming weeks, this is actually going to be a thread that runs right the way through his story. In His infinite wisdom and power, our God actually chooses to work through our weakness, doesn't He? In His infinite wisdom and power, He's a God who somehow manages to bring remarkable good from enormous dysfunction. It's how He operates. And so we start in on the story today, and it's fair to say, wow, there is plenty of dysfunction to go around. In fact, everyone is involved. There's a real absence of innocence through this opening chapter, starting with Joseph, our title character. Take a look at verse 2, for example. End of verse 2, we get introduced to him and the first thing we learn about him is he brought their father a bad report about his brothers. A bad report. Now, that might be justified, like he might have been right in what he said, but the Hebrew word that's used there for bad report is the word debar. And everywhere else it's used in Scripture, it's negative. It's like malicious slander. And the Hebrew word, (laughs) dibba, I mean, that's not an accident either. The very first thing we learn about Joseph is that he is a dibba. I've got three boys at home, so I know firsthand, right? Dobbing on your brothers is never a recipe for harmony and hugs, is it? (laughs) Never. And then things get worse when when Joseph decides it might be a good idea to start sharing his dreams that he's been having, twice through verses 5 to 10. He takes the opportunity to, to tell everyone what God had been giving to him in dream, in his dreams. Dreams that depict his whole family bowing down to him. Now, you know, maybe he's just an external processor. Maybe. But it's like, come on, buddy, like, have a bit more sense, yeah? Like, what was he expecting them to react? How was he expecting them to react as he shared these dreams? 
So I think at best, you kind of say, look, Joseph's young and dumb. At worst, and this is a possibility too, he's actually so wrapped up in his own press, in, in his father's favoritism, he can't even see the situation that he is inflaming as he shares his dreams with them. I mean, jo- Jacob's got a lot to answer for as well, obviously. And anyone that, that grew up with siblings, anyone that has, has had kids themselves, like, you know, just how big a deal family fairness is, right? It's like everyone needs exactly the same amount of ice cream in their bowls, down to the very gram, thank you. Everyone needs exactly the same toppings, down to the very sprinkle. That's the way it is with siblings, right? It's universal. And there is no... And there's no greater recipe for sibling rivalry than when parents start playing favourites. Disastrous. It's exactly what we see Jacob doing here. And it's blatant, like the guy doesn't even try to hide it. Look at verse 3, look how it says, Now Israel, that was another name for Jacob, loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age and he made an ornate rope, robe for him. Absolutely blatant. Now, if you know anything about this story, chances are you know about the coat, right? This coat right here. Now, we don't know if it was actually Technicolor, like the musical suggests, but it was special. It was special. And in fact, it's it's actually more important than the colour, I think, is the style that this coat was in. Biblical historians suggest that it would have been long, running all the way from his palms down to his ankles, The reason why that's important is because it was not at all practical for manual labour, which is what these guys were doing, right? Tending to flocks. This is a coat that is fit for a ruler, someone who stays at home and overseas, doesn't have to go out to the field and sweat. And Joseph wasn't a little kid. We're told that he was 17 years old. He would have, this would not have been his first coat, in other words. In fact, all the brothers would have had coats of their own. This was a second coat. And by Jacob giving it to Joseph, he was actually declaring Joseph to be the Bechor. That's the Hebrew word for firstborn. Very important. And in ancient Near Eastern culture, the Bechor, the firstborn son, was entitled to a double portion of the family's inheritance. And so convention said this coat should have gone to Reuben because he was the actual firstborn son. But as we've heard, Jacob loves Joseph so much, he gives this special coat to him. Even though he's the 11th born son, he gets the double portion. And so in a way, this gesture, it's almost like Jacob is declaring his first 10 sons to be illegitimate. That's certainly how it seems they take it, isn't it? Three times. In the opening verses of this text, we're told that the brothers were filled with jealousy and hatred for Joseph because of this. And you know, anytime you see something repeated three times in the text, that's an indication you really need to pay attention to this. Because you see, while, while Joseph and Jacob certainly played their part in this dysfunction, the lion's share of the blame certainly rests with the brothers. What must have started with maybe annoyance, turns to resentment, and then bitterness. Eventually it festers into hatred and loathing and then jealousy. And it's ugly. It's an ugly picture. You can imagine them kind of angrily muttering to each other under their breath as he walked past, just stoking that rage in one another. Until one day, out of the blue, there's an opportunity them to act and they take it it's a pretty good example i think of how this dysfunction sometimes unfolds right like it'll start as something so small just a little niggle just something really small you barely even notice but but it's left it's not attended to it's not dealt with and it just grows it grows larger and stronger that desire it, it 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 escalates it, it transforms into something powerful. Suddenly there's an opportunity. You might not have even realized it was coming and it comes on you and there it is, your chance to act 
and without much thought, suddenly you've just done what you never imagined you would be capable of doing. And you sit there wondering, how did I get here? That's what's going on in Genesis 37. Take a look at verse 18. It says, they saw him in the distance. How did they know it was him? Of course, he's wearing the coat. Right? He's wearing that coat. And before he reached them, we're told they plotted to kill him. It did not take them long to come to that decision. Such was the desire that had grown within them. Notice here, of course, Joseph wasn't out working the fields with them. Not in his new coat, right? Instead, it seems like he's become the informer for his father who gets to stay at home and just gets sent out to report back on how his brothers are doing. The brothers see this as their opportunity to put an end to, to him flaunting his favoritism. And, you know, by their logic, you can kind of see killing him works because it's going to prove that his dreams were actually wrong. They would never bow down to him if he was dead. And so they decide to murder him. But then in, in a moment of chance, or what seems like chance, some traders come past at the, at the moment that the brothers are trying to decide what to do. And, and they decide, actually, it's going to be better off if we can profit off Joseph's misery. Isn't that terrible? So they send him into slavery. They pocket the cash. They fabricate evidence in order to hide what they've done. They deceive their father. And then they've got the gall to offer to comfort him in his grief. Comfort him for the grief they've caused. Staggering, isn't it? What an ugly picture. It just kind of gets worse and worse. And remember, this is the family of the promise, right? These men will become the 12 tribes of Israel. Think about that for a moment, right? The nation that God had chosen to bring blessing and salvation to the world is utterly dysfunctional. All of them. A distinct absence of innocence. And you know, so it is with us. So it is with us. It's one of the uncomfortable truths at the very heart of the Christian faith. Dysfunction is not just a feature of stories like Joseph's, it's a feature of all of our stories. The truth is we inhabit a dysfunctional world. We're all a part of dysfunctional families ourselves, and we all live our own dysfunctional lives. And it's not a pleasant reality to ponder, but it's true. If we're honest with ourselves, we know it's true. If you were just to trace your wider extended family tree for just, let's say, the last hundred years, do you reckon you'd find much dysfunction? Just a cursory examination of Bell's and my extended family tree over the last hundred years, I mean, there are levels of dysfunction there that, that easily rival Genesis 37. There's addictions, adultery, divorce, there's siblings estranged from one another for decades. Alcohol abuse, periods of incarceration for, for fraud, drug dealing, even murder. And that's just the obvious dramatic stuff. Like to say nothing of the greed and the jealousy and the lying and the hidden rivalries and the bitter resentment that no one even knew about. Friends, the Bible calls this sin. Jesus talks a lot about sin, and for good reason, because grasping the truth about our sin is vitally important. In fact, if we don't get this right, then everything else will be wrong. If we don't get this right, everything else will be wrong. And one of the common mistakes we make, or traps that we fall into when we talk about sin, is that we think about it like it's just a, a list of prohibitive behaviours. You know, don't do this, don't do that. And, and it is that, but actually sinful behaviours are, are a symptom of a much deeper relational problem. Like the way Oswald Chambers, famous Scottish preacher, put it when he said this, sin is, is a fundamental relationship. He calls sin a relationship. 
It's not wrongdoing so much as it is wrong being. A deliberate and emphatic independence from God. It's an interesting way of putting it. Wrong being. And when he says that, that it's a relationship, he means that sin is really a posture of our hearts. It's, it's an orientation towards God where creature says to creator, thanks, but I'm going to take it from here. I don't need you. I don't want you. I'm going to go my own way. I'm going to write my own rules. Don't get in my way. Don't tell me what to do. That's sin. And in some ways, it's a little bit like doing a jigsaw puzzle. Belle is the puzzle master in our house, and so she'll like to spend hours on holidays with a puzzle sprawled out all across the dining table. And what I enjoy doing while she's intently poring over the pieces is I'll come over her shoulder, just poke my head over, just wait and watch for a moment. Then I'll go, found one, and I'll pick up a piece and I'll jam it into the wrong spot. (laughs) And she goes from delight to dismay in about half a second flat. Gets it every time. That is like our sin. Not the annoying bell part, that's pure joy. But sin is like jamming the wrong piece of the puzzle into the wrong place. Because you see, the truth is, God's created this world for us. And he he gives us a magnificent picture of how his world functions best. And like a jigsaw, we've got the task of kind of putting the pieces of his creation together together according to his design, according to that lid, the picture on the lid. But what do we do? We toss the lid out. We ignore the way that it's meant to look, and instead we try to put the pieces together however we think is best. That's what we see happening all throughout Genesis 37, again and again and again. As we try putting together our own way, like the pieces don't fit... So we've got to jam them together or hammer them in with our fist. I mean, what happens? What happens when when you try to force the pieces together? The edges bend and they soften. They start to fray. The cardboard starts fraying. Eventually, parts will fall off. And because there's nothing fits neatly, there are gaps and spaces all over the place. But most of all, I mean, what happens to that magnificent picture that the puzzle was meant to make? Well, the monstrosity we create, it, it's now unrecognizable. It's a, it's a complete mess compared to the way that it was meant to be. Friends, that is sin. It is tossing out God's original intention and trying to do it ourselves. It is forcing the wrong pieces into the wrong places. No wonder the edges of our world are fraying. The edges of our lives end up bent and broken. And no wonder there are spaces and gaps everywhere. Sin has rendered our world almost completely unrecognizable from the way God created it to be. That goes for the dysfunction in Genesis 37, goes for the dysfunction we read about in the news that entertains us, On reality TV, it goes for the dysfunction within our families and within our own hearts. None of it is the way that it was meant to be. Because when we sever our connection to the Creator, to the one who made this place, well, of course that's going to be the result. Why would it be any other way? So where does that leave us? Well, it is fair to say this is a pretty bleak start to our series. Not super cheery. (laughs) The gospel according to Joseph. And I want to warn you, it's actually not going to be the only low moment as this story continues. But you know, as dark as this beginning might be, hope is not lost. You see, although God is not named in chapter 37, his fingerprints are all over it. You see, it's no accident that Joseph was given those dreams. They were were a divine revelation of what was about to come, a promise even. And it was also no accident that those traders were coming past. At the exact moment, his brothers were trying to decide what to do. That saved Joseph's life, preserved his life. 
So friends, hope remains because as the the chapter closes, Joseph still lives, which means God's plans persist. Turns out there is no amount of dysfunction that can get in God's way. And that is also going to be one of the overarching themes of this entire story. God's plans persist despite the darkness of our world's dysfunction. Because in the end, sin doesn't get the final word. I mean, wasn't that precisely what we're all here celebrating last weekend? I mean, Easter is the ultimate declaration that sin doesn't get the final say. Because Jesus, a son of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, he finally came and he fulfilled God's grand promise by giving his life, by rising from the dead. And so the cross and the empty tomb is the definitive proof that sin doesn't win. At the cross, writes Tim Keller, we, we see the worst that sin can do. As humanity, of which each of us is a part, crucified the Lord. But at the cross, we also see that the most that sin can do cannot thwart God's salvation. Isn't that a great reminder? Friends, as dark as the dysfunction gets, be that in Joseph's story in our own families, or even in our own hearts, the repeated refrain throughout the story of the Bible is that sin doesn't get the final word. As it is true in Joseph's story, may that also be true in our own. Let's pray. Lord God, in turning away from you, we've made a a massive mess of your creation made a mess of our families and of our own lives. Lord, we're sorry for our dysfunction. Break our hearts for what breaks yours. Lord, may this word that you've planted in our hearts this morning take deep root. May it produce in us the fruit of repentance, a turning away from our sin. May it also produce in us the fruit of thankfulness and gratitude for your amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved wretches like us. Thank you, Lord, that sin doesn't get the final say. Amen. We're going to sing in reflection of these truths. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Let's stand and sing those words together now.